Hi, this is Mark Hudson, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, you mama Luke. And hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns. It's a wonder that he has time to do this show. And that being our very own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. I would always find time for the show. Always, always. Uh, hello, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. That's because you're Mr. Dedication. That's true. On the show today, we have a special guest with us on the phone. It's Chris Carter, who is the host of Breakfast with the Beatles, which airs on KLOS in Los Angeles on Sunday mornings. And he also does a show on Sirius XM. It's a British Invasion show. And actually, we're here to talk to Chris because something special happened on his program on KLOS on this past Sunday, which uh, I think will be of quite a bit of interest to Beatle fans because it concerns a piece of music that is believed to be the Beatles, and it was aired for the first time in its entirety on Chris's show. So we welcome Chris Carter to Things We Said Today. Hi, Chris. What's happening, guys? What's happening? I just want to first start off by saying thank you to both you, Steve and Ken, for what you do, because we know we use your news every week when Jackie DeShannon does our news, even though we give the illusion that, you know, Jackie is out there like Jimmy Olsen gathering these news stories herself. Uh, you know, it's you guys that do it. So I want to thank you for giving me uh, ample copy every week for Jackie to read, so I just wanted to say thanks to start. Oh, you, you, well, you're you're very welcome, and, and we're very thrilled to have you here. This is this is really this is really going to be a lot of fun. And it's really Steve that does all the legwork in, in gathering the news, which he does oh, not just once a week, but every day for Beatles Exam. Oh, gee. So yeah, kudos to yeah. you. He does a great job, doesn't he, Ken? He does. I get all my thanks. news from him. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to both of you. We all steal from Steve. <laughs> That's what this is all about. <laughs> so, hey, you guys want to talk about the uh, Ringo Starr transistor radio song, huh? Yeah. That's what, yeah, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, let me just say, Chris uh, fill, uh, clued me in that something was going to happen on Sunday. Uh, he, he sent me, an, I heard about it Saturday, but he didn't tell me what. And then when I listened to the show Sunday morning and I heard that, I was like, Really? And, you know, i got to say that, I mean, everybody's heard the song, and everybody's pro probably wondered, but, you know, the question of whether it was actually the Beatles has never, and we were talking about this off the air before we got started, has never really been broached with any of the group. And right now we're, we are running around trying to get comments from, you know, people who would know, but they've never, this has never been discussed with them. And the fact that, there appears to be evidence that it is them. It's really exciting. Chris, you want to talk about, you know, yeah, what ha yeah, what the background was? What happened. And, uh, you know, it's kind of something we can all, we're all witnessing, you know. I don't think there's a definitive decision made, but when you take all the elements and you put it together, you know, you come up with your own conclusions. So I had a guest on my show Sunday, a guy named Dave Morrell. And Dave Morrell is a long, long time Beatle fanatic from the early 70s when he was a teenager. He was infamous for um, being the kid who gave John Lennon a bootleg called Yellow Matter Custard, which John Lennon thought was the Decca tapes, which really wasn't the Decca tapes, but he actually wrote letters to George and Paul about finding the Decca tapes, and we ought to put this out. You can get to see it in the John Lennon letters book. But mm. this kid, Dave Morrell from New Jersey, partnered up with another kid from New Jersey, Ron Fermanac, who is also uh, kind of well-known in Beatles circles for doing a lot of remastering and working on all the Apple stuff. If you Google Ron Fermanac, you look how many records this guy worked on, your jaw drops. 
So this guy, Ron Fermanac, always is searching for anything he can find. He's in dumpsters. He's always looking in places for any kind of rare things. He came up with all this shindig stuff once. and Basically, he was doing some searching out here in Los Angeles, and he went to Universal Film Lot and came across a couple of boxes that interested him, and one of them said, George Martin, Hard Day's Night, <laughs> and the other one said, The Beatles. So the one that said George Martin, Hard Day's Night, had like three versions of you know Ringo's theme and some incidental music that wasn't used in the film. And the second box had the 41 second song, the bit that comes out of Ringo's transistor radio in A Hard Day's Night in the train compartment scene. So <laughs> with the beginning account in, you know, very almost, you know, non-audible count in, and a song which starts, you know, and ends the whole song. So this is, you know, quite a find, but the question is, well, is it the Beatles? And if you look at Mark Lewison's book, there's no mention of it. If you look anywhere, there's no mention of it. Hmm. So I started to call around when I, you know, knew Dave was coming on the show. I knew he was coming on the show a couple of weeks before he came on. So I called, you know, first I called Martin Lewis, <laughs> who, you know, he thinks he's the world's greatest Hard Day's Night expert. So I said, Martin. You know that song that comes out of Ringo's to well, who is that? What is that? He goes, Well, Chris, you have you know, we've done a lot of research and blah, 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 blah. and it's uh bottom line he said was uh EMI tape library music out of the library, like the beginning of, you know, uh Bungalow Bill, you know. Hmm. Um so he said, Oh, really? Okay. And then I called, you know, Mr. Lewison. We emailed Mark Lewison and uh Mark, what do you know about this? I don't know anything about that noise coming out of Ringo's transistor. Why? What do you know? And that's so he didn't know. Then I call Bruce Spizer. Bruce, what's it? And he doesn't know. Nobody knows anything. Hmm. So the question is, why wouldn't it be documented? Why wouldn't there be something? You know. So I think, and this is just my guess, is that it wasn't a Beatles session because everything is documented, especially things at EMI that the Beatles did. But it could perhaps be a George Martin session, George Martin orchestra. The incidental music that they found in the other boxes had to be recorded. No one's paying attention to those. Also, it was live, if you listen to it. There's no overdubs or anything. It's just the four guys playing. So there's not going to be a track listing, per se. There's not going to be, you know, George is on track two. This is not, you know, 1964. So I think it was a live one-off, and there would be no paperwork for it and there you have it plus also <laughs> if it was somebody else say it was some band say it was somebody wouldn't you in 50 years say hey you know that music coming out of that transit that's me and the boy you know somebody would say it somewhere hmm. and uh that's that's what where we're at well a couple of questions here first of all i want to address this to both of you in all these years that you've watched the hard day's night like it's the bible did it ever occur to you that that music would be the Beatles? Did you ever think it was? How about you, Chris? I honest, honestly, I never thought about it. I thought it sounded like Beatle era music, which was the idea of it in the first place, is to them, you know, maybe not to sound like the Beatles, but to sound like your generic rock and roll from 1964 coming right. out of England. That's what I thought. I always thought it had a bit of a I saw her standing there feel to it. I have to say that when I and I'm thinking back, you know, to 64 when I first saw the movie, I really didn't think there was anybody else it could be because number because for for the simple reason that why would they have used somebody else to pretend to to sound like why would, would they've gone to that trouble? Yeah, well, you know, the idea was they were supposedly listening to what's coming out of the radio, and never are they the Beatles in the movie, right? So it's not really... <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's like, who, who else would it be? I think they're just trying to give the example of, you know, what's coming out of the radio, but it, they were so insulated anyway, who else would it be? The Dave Clark Five? <laughs> you know? It would have been It would have been too easy. I'm not, not too easy. It would have been... 
it would have been the easiest thing to do would have just been to grab a scrap of, you know, 30 seconds of beetle jamming or something and throw that on that, you know, uh, use that as the radio, as that radio music, rather well, than actually... That? That's, not, that's not what that is. That could be, you know, think about it, guys. That snippet could have been, like you said, three minutes after they did I Saw Her Standing There, that they had on tape laying around, and George Martin said, oh, yeah, you know, boom, they were tuning. They did this, now it's in the movie. It could be that innocent. It could be that much. It could be that... You know, right. it wasn't done specifically for the. Tra- they didn't say come at one o'clock for the transistor thing. Hmm. It might have just been a scrap. Right. You know, it begs the question is of whether they would have actually used somebody else in there, and I don't think they. And and it no, doesn't make sense that they would have. Reasons, right, Ken? They wouldn't have done it just for copyright reasons. If that was the Yardbirds, if that was the Shadows, if that was the studio musicians, all those things would all be documented. You can't use somebody else's songs. You have to, there has to be a listen, except if it was the Beatles. And then they wouldn't have to. Then they would bypass it because there's, you know, all those other Beatles songs in the movie. That's not going to be a thing. That's true, and they had a very limited budget to begin with. Right. They're not going to go hire out somebody for 10 seconds. I think it's more likely to even be, as we're, as we're talking about this, I think it's more likely that it was a scrap, you know? Mm-hmm. So... And that, that's another reason why it wouldn't be documented. It wouldn't, if, that was an, if that was done, you've heard all those boo, how many times they do, yes, it is, right? They do it 32 times, right? Right. I mean, I mean say it's a, a little, that's one note, it's an E. I mean, that could easily be after I saw her standing there. It could be, in, you know, maybe a little later, because it probably wasn't from early 63. It's probably more in 64. But still, any time it could have been. I think, though, Chris, you also have to look at the possibility that it was indeed a something that was filled in, uh, you know, kind of like the way sitcoms used to grab rock, you know, uh, music and, you know, throw it in the back of, you know, in the back of uh, shows. You know, it could very well have been something like that, too. But it sounds, that, but the but the thing weighing in the Beatles' favor is that it sounds, there there is a Beatles sound to it. Maybe not a conclusive Beatles sound, but it does sound a little like the Beatles. Right. And the other thing we said on the show, the other thing that really weighs heavily in its favor is it came out of a box that said the Beatles. Next right. to a box that said a hard day's night, George Martin, that had real George Martin incidental music. That's no phony. In other words, if the box of incidental music was, you know, um, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, then it, the whole thing is, is, is a sham. But the fact that the, it's, it's with a box that has three versions of that you've never heard of Ringo's theme before. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Well, yeah, that's, a, that's what's in the box. It's, in, it's incidental music and three versions of, of Ringo's theme. Well, does, Dave have, does Dave have that stuff? I does, believe Ron has it. Ron has it? Dave has it. I didn't even ask him. No one even okay. before George Martin. No one cares about that. Everybody right. wants to know about the Beatles song. Oh, I actually, Chris, I care about that because in the movie, isn't the version, the instrumental version of this boy different from what was on the album, the American yeah, album? The one on the album, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah these are, this, this whole thing is a great find. But like I was saying to play Devil's Advocate, the guy who plays John Lennon in the Fab Four, who are one of the better of the Beatles tribute bands, right. they're the Fab Four, they're the guys that... They are the guys that, if you watch the Beatles rock band, they're the guys. They were the guys that are the Beatles. You know, they they wired them up and made them the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Ron, who's a kook, he's uh, he's one of those guys that collects. They make so much money that he collects, you know, crazy stuff. He, he'll call you up and say, Four, three of my friends are gonna all pitch in and buy a monkey mobile. If you pitch in, you get to own it for three months of the year." <laughs> You're like, "Oh, gee, Ron. Okay, well." Let me think about that. I'll talk to the wife and see if she thinks that's a good investment, and we'll get back to you. But anyway, he bid on this piece of music that was a, a, a 27 second version of this was um, on an acetate three or four years ago, but it wasn't complete. It was just the beginning, and then the middle was gone, and then just the end. It was like stupid. But he and he claims his point of view, and he collects a lot of Beatle things. Is he claims it's not Ringo on the drums. He's Swears. He's one of those guys that can tell. He says the amp is a Fender 63 and the guitar is a great. He, he's one of those guys, right? He says he doesn't think it's Ringo on the drums. 
So there's another little bit of hmm. devil advocacy. There. Well, let, let me ask you both this. Forget about all this information that we have about the tape box and it says Beatles on it. Forget about all that. Just from your ears alone, your gut reaction, do you think it's the Beatles? If you just yes. heard it in its entirety right now, with no information to back it up, except that you know it was used at that moment in the film on the transistor radio, do you think it's the Beatles? Yes. Okay, Chris, uh, well, Chris for what reason? The bass. The guitar. The I'd, 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 no, I'd go with the lead guitar. Yeah, no, George's, I mean, the, the one-note George thing is, is there, but that bass playing... Um, oh, hold on. Wait, hold on. Just got an email from Giles Martin. Ah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Back to London. I haven't had a moment yet. I will get back to you tomorrow. All the best, Giles. <laughs> All right. <laughs> in the Martin household. That's what we're looking for. We're just looking for... Because George Martin will know more than Ringo. <laughs> this is, this is, this is a, a news alert, folks. <laughs> okay. Breaking news. We just got word from Giles Martin. <laughs> That's cool. So, so should we make this a two-parter? We could. <laughs> we got to find the answer because I think that's the best source, you know. Um, well, I, I like I like I told you, I've checked. I'm checking with a few people too, and, and we're trying to get. You know, um, the problem is that you know some people aren't going to are not necessarily going to answer this, and that's what Mr. you know. His son listens to our show, and I can't for the life of me find his email. He, he occasionally sends me things. He's a really nice guy. Gotta find his, gotta find his email. But we'll who else could who else could we contact? Besides, well, I didn't. I, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know Walter Shenson's nobody son. Nobody better so. than nobody better than George Martin. I'm telling you, George Martin will know that answer. Sure, he, he will. Was only clear-headed guy around at the time that we could go to. <laughs> <laughs> and will remember that vividly. He'll tell you. He'll know because when he watches that movie, guys like the way we watch it, when he watches it, he knows what he's hearing. He knows. He, he records right. that. He, know, he cut that tape or he found that. that he, is, he is the sole man responsible for what comes out of that transistor radio. Paul McCartney <laughs> is probably, you know, 13th on that list that might know. Ringo, forget it. <laughs> uh, what about, what well, about Richard Lester? Could, th- those are the guys that know. Those are the guys that would know. But I don't think anybody would know more than George Martin because that man was in charge of the music in that movie. I'm working I'm working on Richard Lester. Um That's his job. I'm working uh, I mean, I mean, he, Lester, if you can get a hold of him. I'm I'm trying to get somebody somebody is is trying to get get through to him. So we may get the answer from him too. I don't know. But you know what's more interesting, guys? Mm. The fact that Mr. Lewison Spizer you know, pick your guy, you know, Martin Luther. None of these guys has a solid answer and knows anything at all about it. That's what's interesting. Well, no, I, th- I think actually it sound, there's enough of a Beatles sound where you can't dismiss it. I think that's the important thing here. Yeah, who else I would mean, it be? Who else who would be making that film, who would be in possession of all the, you know, everything, <laughs> would put that music in there? What else would it be? Well, it, it could it could very I mean it you know and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute and say it could very well be kind of some studio thing that they cooked up somewhere, you know some nameless you know studio musicians that right. they had on hand. It could very well be that, but it, there's enough of a Beatles sound to it, and I mean a very a clear Beatles sound. If not even though it's not really conclusive, that you can't just dismiss it completely. Let me ask um, you this question, Steve. How many guys do you think it took to play that? Four, right? Four guys, right? Bass, two. Well, uh, 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 bass and drums. That's I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, I, I, it there's would have to be engineer. drums. I mean, there's it would have to be. F- there. Wait, there's an engineer there, mm-hmm. and probably some second engineer to put mics up, and possibly a producer. So there's like nine guys involved with that recording, and nobody in 50 years claims the fact that they're playing in a hard day's night. Right. That's a, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent that's an excellent point, Chris. Because yeah, somebody would have somebody would have come out somewhere and said something. And if somebody was playing it, there would be a track list. There would be documentation. If it was the Beatles in between four songs one afternoon, that seems more likely. 
one thing that you mentioned that I that you said that no book has ever mentioned it. John John Wynn in um Yeah, yeah, yeah. No we mentioned it. Yeah, I said so that. John C. Wynn mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. He says it's he said Shenton says it's the Beatles. Right. He mentioned oh. he mentioned that although I have to say I went scouting for that uh interview last night and I couldn't find it. I did find what appeared to be it's on page one twenty one. The the, inter- the interview? No, 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 not the not the actual. Inter- I'm looking for the actual interview. Oh. That no, I no, I saw the I saw his listing, but I was looking for the actual interview. Okay. So. But also um, to to answer your question there, Chris, and I'm not sure about publishing rights and and what's required in films, but don't you need to have a certain number of bars in a song for it to be required that it's listed in the credits? You only have a few seconds of that song anyway. Yeah, if you're under. You know the way it is in England is a little different than the way it is in America. In England, it's a lot more, they're a lot more loose. But yeah, yeah, in in America, it's like you know, 21 seconds. If it's under 21 seconds, you pay this. If it's over that, then you're into the next thing. But yeah, and again, if it's all self-contained, then they don't they don't even care about that stuff. Hmm. The Beatles, part of the Beatles music and the Beatles film. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it gets dodgy if it's somebody if it's if it's the shadows then it then it's dodgy then the shadows manager and the publishing and Dick James and everybody is knocking on your door. That's why they wouldn't use somebody else's music like Steve says. Why would they? Why bother? You got the freaking Beatles. Right. <laughs> right. Let's get a little, let's get somebody to imitate some uh, rock music. The scenario I'm thinking is that you know they knew they they were going to need that music and they said, you know, we'll pull 30 seconds of scrap you know, of of outros or something, and we'll use that. You know, that's that's, what I think. that's, what that's I think. having this conversation. I haven't really thought about it until you guys, you know, started to bring it up in depth. But yeah, I think it's more of that. I think it's more of it's a, it's a bit of it's a bit of scrap than you know purposeful mm-hmm. for that scene. I I, ser- I really really hope so. I I really do because I mean. I, it you know it'd be very it's obviously that. very cool and then wait till George Martin comes and proves us all wrong completely. yeah <laughs> that's so that right. was me on all the instruments I was uh, bored one night and I just said I could imitate these rock and rollers it's nothing <laughs> are you kidding me I could do that half asleep there, there we go well I don't there mind I don't mind if George Martin embarrasses us yeah that would be fun <laughs> that would be fun maybe we can get him. You know, we, maybe we can get them on the phone. You know, who knows? We'll see that would be Giles that would be excellent. I would love to. I would love to talk to him. Giles is certainly approachable enough. Well, you know something, you, uh, Chris. You gave us uh, the music to use for this show. We've been talking about this uh, thirty-seven seconds. It is of uh, instrumental from what we believe to be the Beatles. So why don't we just play it? I think it it would only make sense. <laughs> And maybe let our listeners decide. Who knows? But uh, why don't we play it right now? So this is, it's. I guess it's labeled as train music. That's yes. what I've been told. Okay. From what we believe to be the Beatles. Here it goes. You know, I have to agree. I really think it is the Beatles because it does sound like George there on guitar, mm-hmm. and the that bass does sound bass, like Paul. And that moving bass is one James Paul McCartney got to be right. I don't hmm. know who else is who's rocking like that in early '64 like that in a rock and roll band. You know, that's uh, that's above average bass playing. <laughs> and it does sound to me like it could just be a music bed where they didn't know where it would be used. They just did it. I mean, if they can insert it somewhere in the film, wherever it may be. When they do that stuff, that's what they, you you heard, God, I mean, we've heard the Let It Be tapes, right? But even back then, in 64 or 65, when they were in between songs, that's exactly what they would do. 12 Bar bar Blues. Mm -hmm. They could never sit still. They would just say, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that would be something they might just 
Boom. Mm-hmm. Um, Twelve Bar Blues is a good example of you know something that, that they did like right. that. So there you go. Yeah. Exactly. So there, there, that's kind of fun, right? Something like new in 2014 from 1964, and it's right here, like on the 50th anniversary week, almost, right? So it's of a hard day's night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of exciting, right? It is. It's very exciting. How many it's other exciting. bands can you think of where a 37 second instrumental bed? <laughs> would cause this much interest. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. All right. So do we want to talk about anything else? Just briefly, I mean, the other big thing this week is Paul McCartney's announcement yesterday that he's adding another show to his um, his tour, and he also put out a video that um, showed him, you know, that he to prove to everybody that he's feeling much better. And... Um, the one thing that I mentioned last night when I was writing it, you know, writing this thing up was, you know, he has no intention of slowing down. I mean, if anybody was wondering if he was going to slow down, he just basically said, "No way, dudes! I'm adding more shows to my tours," you know. And I got to ask you guys, Steve and Ken, this is something we always make a a big deal about on on Breakfast with the Beatles. Have you guys ever noticed, speaking of Paul's longevity, how? Mr. McCartney can do a two-hour-plus show and never drink a sip of water on stage. Have you ever noticed that? Of course. I had to, I, No, I have not. Water. He never drinks water. I've seen him in the desert in Coachella. I hosted his thing, right, when he did the Apollo. And before he came on, I was sitting with all these people, right, little Steven and Cousin Brucey and all these people, and I bet them all five bucks. I go, okay, <laughs> we're in this hot box. I mean, the Apollo was like, it was like 100 degrees, right? And... I said, you watch Paul. He will not have a sip of water the whole, and he'll be singing on top of his lung. You know, he's singing, he's sweat. He never drinks any water. He does during sound check. People send me pictures during sound check. But go watch him and notice next time. Bet who's ever next to you. I bet you Paul won't take any water. And it, we just find this to be interesting. And one day we had Pat Denizio from the Smithereens on. Right. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about that. Because, um, don't don't forget, we we've had Rusty. And um, Brian, Ray, and Abe, we've, we've asked them all about it. They all back us up right there. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't drink water, right? Okay. So Pat Denizio says, you know why he doesn't drink water, don't you? Why, Pat, tell us. It's an old showbiz adage. You don't drink in front of a paying audience. You don't drink water. You don't do that. <laughs> People pay to see you. It's an old showbiz thing. And that's the reason Paul doesn't do it, apparently. You don't drink in front of an audience. Hmm. I didn't know that was the reason. Check it out. When you watch him on tour, find out. Uh, oh, I've, I've always noticed that. Each if he has any water. <laughs> Chris, just out of curiosity, since we're talking about Paul Live, have you seen all the Paul tours in the U.S. from Wings Over America on? I have. Do you have a favorite tour of them all? Well, personally, you know, the, the 76 tour was my favorite just because I was a kid and you know, I saw it at Madison Square Garden. It was the real deal for me. I was there with so you. Was, what's that? <laughs> I was there with you. Yeah, I mean, that was a great, you know, that was a great one. Um, as far as his bands go, I really have to say that this band is, without a doubt, you know, the best band. I think they're just awesome. You know, they're, you know Abe, I, I, I can go watch Abe for an hour. Just just watch Abe by himself. He's just hmm. incredible. Um, I, I I have to say I I enjoy watching Brian and Rusty work off each other. I think they're amazing. I, I really well, you do. You just like their hair, don't you, Steve? You uh, <laughs> you find them uh, attractive <laughs> gentlemen, do you? I mean, no, God. <laughs> He's very jealous of Brian's hair. Hey, you know Brian Ray's been around the block. Let me tell you, he he's no spring chicken. He was in a band. <laughs> I had this. Uh, I heard a couple albums by this guy named Reggie Knightington. The Reggie Knightington band came out like 78, 79. They, mm-hmm. Thomas Baker produced them. Hmm. And Brian Ray is in the band. He's got a pick. He's got like a, a feather in his mouth. You know? Do you know who his sister is? Who, Brian? Do you know who his sister is? Do you ever hear of Jim and Jean? No. Jim and Jean, the folk singers. That's his sister. I don't. I don't even know who they are. Oh, look him up, look him up, and not only that, he told me in an interview that Cinnamon Girl was written about Gene. Neil Young wrote Cinnamon Girl about Gene. Wow, wow, 
Wow, yep. that's interesting. No, I didn't yes. know that. I didn't know that. Steve did an interview with Brian uh, a while ago. I remember reading about it on Beatles Examiner, and he's got a long history of doing lots of session work, and especially with oh, Ed Eddie James. Eddie James. Yeah. Yeah, he worked Johnny, with Johnny Holiday, the French, yeah. the French singer. Yeah, no, he's been around the block. Yeah, he's not. Uh, yeah, he's not a young guy, but he looks great for his age. I know. God, he yes, that. he does. When I interviewed him, I think it was probably about three or four years ago. He told me his age, and I was like. Really? You're I, I couldn't believe he was yeah, he was as old as he told me. Yeah. And but and he and so we're not I mean, he and I are not that far apart. I'm a little older than he is, but right. we are he and I are not that far apart and I'm amazed. You know who, I mean you know he's really star, going Huh? Off the, you know, going off the Beatles tip for a minute. You know which rock star looks the best at his age? Ian Hunter. Ian Hunter is 75 years old, and he looks exactly like he did in 1975. Yeah, he does. I, ha- I haven't seen him since. Uh, uh, or I did see. I did see some of the footage from the uh, Moth Hoople um, reunion. Amazing. But yeah, he looks fantastic. Because he has that like light red hair, so he doesn't get wrinkles. You know, he's that fair skin. But mm-hmm. He doesn't have any wrinkles, and he has the hair and the sunglasses. He's exactly the same. It's amazing. Truly amazing. Wow. He's older than all the Beatles. He's older than every Beatle. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, so this has been great, Chris. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you on the show. And, thank you, uh, Beetle Chris. <laughs> and thank you again, guys. Um, and I'll tell you what, I'll, I promise you, as soon as I hear back from um, Giles, if he talks to his dad, I'll, I'll let you guys know and we'll, we'll follow up and maybe we'll get an answer. Chris, do us a favor. I know, I know your, your show is available nationally um, on the Internet. Tell everybody when they can hear you. Please. Oh, yeah, we're on Sunday mornings from 9 till noon. Pacific, Pacific time. time. Yeah, and uh, we're on KLOS, and you can get that on iHeartRadio or KLOS.com or any way you listen to things on the Internet, or you can listen to it on the radio if you're in Southern California. And you're also on Sirius? Yeah, yeah, I do a show called Chris Carter's British Invasion, which is really a lot of fun. It's just not British Invasion stuff from 64 to 68. It's you know, the aforementioned Mott the Hoople and Oasis and T-Rex and, you know, the Stripes and the Moons and the Temples and all sorts of new stuff mixed in. When do you, when you get time to do all these things? Wow, it's really not a lot to do two shows a week. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, there's five other days left. So, uh, okay. I work on them at night, and uh, the serious show I do it from my home in my underwear, and I send it out to the air, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not that tough. It's a good thing it's an audio show. Exactly. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> it's it's very interesting that you that you mentioned the British Invasion show goes really past the 60s. Most people, when you think British Invasion, a lot of people think, well, 64 on, especially in America. But that's really, uh, you know, an interesting angle. Yeah, because I, I look at the stuff that happened in England as important. And to me, Slade and T-Rex and all that stuff was really... Uh, a great time in 71, 2, and 3, and then the Britpop stuff. I love Blur and Oasis and all that stuff uh, there in the mid-'90s. It was another great resurgence. So, yeah, and there's a lot of new stuff that's really great that sounds like old stuff. <laughs> so we love that. That's great to, to mix it all together. Yep. You know, we keep it 60s. You know, it's like 60% 60s, you know, and then the rest we just split it all up, you know. But mm-hmm. you keep your core stuff. So a lot of kinks. A lot of creation, you know, a lot of Beatles and Stones and who, you know, but it's uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Chris. And uh, thanks, guys. let's let's. Thank uh, you, Chris. Thank you very much, Beatle Chris. <laughs> hey, thanks. Go. Thanks for letting us use the music here and uh, come on the show again. All right. Okay. I hope it was the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> and that show sure was great having Chris Carter here with us on the show. And I had a lot of fun. I hope you did, too. We'll all have to wonder if that really is the Beatles or not. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks to Chris Carter for coming on the show. That was, that was indeed a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. And we will see you next time.